All right, so ladies and gentlemen, if you're here, that means you're probably here for the Cactus Talk. If you're not, um, you should stick around anyway. I'm Commodore Z, you can call me Z. Uh, and so this is my homebrew computer, and we're gonna do this a little interesting differently. So there's gonna be some history lesson to this. Uh, I'm a vintage computer geek. I love old computers, primarily Commodore machines. Uh, I don't know if you can tell by my belt buckle. I, I really like the Commodore 64. So let's get started. First part here, some historical context, then after that, design and build process, and then uh, a little bit of front panel demo, and then we'll give you guys a chance to play with it. We'll run some basic programs, because the demo god seems to be shining on me today. So we'll, we'll let you actually get in there. So first things first, the 1970s. How many of you remember this 1970s? Show of hands. Okay, I don't. The rest of you, we're in the same boat here. Uh, and how many of you are familiar with the 6502 processor? Cool, that's awesome. How many of you have seen one with a front panel? That's what I thought. Okay. So, it's the 1970s. Microprocessors are a big thing. We got the Intel 8008 in 1972. It's a good start. That's a picture of one. And two years later, we get really things start to heat up with the 8080 and the Motorola 6800. Finally, people are starting to make computers based on these instead of from scratch. The next year, uh, MOS technology, specifically some guys that spun off from Motorola. Uh, you ever heard of the name Chuck Peddle? He, uh, he kind of, let's just say they decided to make their own version, uh, the 6501. And Motorola sued them because it was a drop-in replacement, and it was faster, and it was simpler, and it was cheaper. And they were like, uh-uh, you're not doing this. So they modified a few things after that whole lawsuit, and the 6502 is now a thing. It's popular. It's cheap. Same kind of thing, uh, 1976, Zilog does the same thing with the, the Z80. They create something cheaper, they add some features, but it's very much like an 8080. RCA, at the same time, is combining two of their chips. They combine uh, two separate things and make one microprocessor. Uh, you see it on um, uh, spacecraft applications, believe it or not, because it's uh, very radiation hardened. Some people say, oh, it's on Voyager, it's on Pioneer. No, 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 Galileo. That's where you'll see it. Anywhere else, somebody's probably pulling your leg. But for the first time ever, we have these, not just microprocessors, chips that will go with them. Seen here, we got, uh, what are these, 8255s with an 8080A. Some, these, these are chips to help you out using the microprocessor. Things are getting easy. Things are getting fun. We don't have to do it all in 7400 series logic. 6502 is no exception. It's got its own family of parts. But for the first time ever, you don't have to be like this guy. This is Bob Lash. He homebrews his own computer from the ground up. This guy's a pure badass. Everything he's doing here is from the ground up. He, he you know, it, it, instead of having to build your own ALU from, the, from scratch or take an existing ALU and then building everything up around it to use that, you just buy a microprocessor. Things are easy now. Homebrewing is finally a thing. Um, now, this is not a homebrew, but this is a kit. We're going to go through a handful of kits for front panel references first. This is a Kenback 1 from 72 by John Blankenbaker. Push buttons, but it's all done in 7400 series logic. It's got 256 bytes of RAM using shift registers. Um, but the push buttons, that's fun. I like that. And then uh, in 74, you got the Selby and the Mark 8. These are things that you would see in radio electronics. Uh, you could buy the boards, at least for the Mark 8. No Mark 8 looks the same as any other Mark 8. You just got the boards, you populated, you added your other stuff as you saw fit. Same goes for the Selby. And then we got the Watershed, 75. Everybody loves that issue of Popular Electronics with the Altair 8800. This front panel is amazing, and we'll get to what inspired it in a bit here, but it's simple, it's effective. You're doing front panel DMA. It's nice and easy for the most part. Um, but this is a kit that you can buy. You can start with 256 bytes of RAM, and you're getting somewhere. And then the same time, uh, Southwest Technical Products comes out with the 6800. It's also based off of, you know, microprocessor, but no front panel here. It's assuming that you're going to use a terminal. Okay, that means we can do basic. That's nice. Um, and then MITS comes back and says, well, we'll make our own 6800 based machine. And uh, you get the under-engineered, and some people say poorly engineered, Altair 680, it's got a front panel, sure, but there's not much to it. You have to manually increment your addresses. 
it's, it's kind of tiny. It's assuming that you're going to be running from ROM, which is annoying because it's only got a hundred, uh, 1K of memory built in. Then if you want to get into really cheap fun stuff, 75 from November of Popular Electronics, this is the uh, Cosmac Elf based on the 1802 processor. I like this guy. Um, the idea was you could read through the article and build it yourself with parts that you picked up from Radio Shack. I mean, there's nothing much here in terms of uh, pre-made kit. It's you got to make it how you want to make it, but this is a good blueprint. Very minimal front panel. Like the previous ones here, um, failed to mention it, but it's using the processor to help you do that direct memory access. In this case, it's automatically incrementing your address for you. And the processor's running at this time to help you with this DMA. But there's not much to it. It's kind of minimal, but it's cheap, really cheap. You can make one of these for under $100 and 75. Or sorry, excuse me, 76. Uh, and then a couple of Steves from, uh, from California make this thing here. This is an Apple One. Look at that beautiful ceramic and gold 6502. It's amazing. But there's no front panel. We're finally getting to more sophisticated stuff, but we're also much more expensive. $666. They didn't sell too many of these. Um, but the idea is there's no front panel here. And then going back a little further, just for front panel comparisons, this is a Digital Equipment Corporation's PDP-8E. Amazing front panel experience. It assumes that you're going to be doing a lot of data entry. So they made it as well as they could uh, to make it easy, you know, ease of use is important. Uh, it's a 12-bit mini computer. Uh, this is one of the later revisions from, I want to say, 69 or 70, something like that. Uh, the original one's from 1965. It's huge. It's about the size of a mini fridge. And then when we get to Unix territory with the 1170, oh yeah, we're 16-bit now. But this front panel, su still super easy to use because it assumes that you're going to be doing bootstrapping and stuff like that from the panel. This is what HP was up to at the time. This is the HP 1000. There's no lack latching switches here. No toggles that lock. It's all push buttons. And if you want to see different registers or if you want to actually enter something or change what address that you're working at, you have to change it with that little switch at the very bottom here and move left and right. I'm going to see if I can get this off of here. Perfect. Awesome. This guy, this is one of my favorites in terms of design. This is the Data General Nova 1200. This has two, uh, influences two major machines, but first off, this is what uh, they came up with to uh, undercut Digital Equipment Corporation. They thought, hey, we can make that same machine and we can make it cheaper with less parts and do the same kind of thing, same amount of power. That lesson goes and influences Wozniak and he says, ah, I can make these things simpler and cheaper, do more with less. But at the same time, the layout of the front panel the way that the switches are operating, for the most part, this is what influences the Altair 8800's design. And then we got the mother of all front panels, in my opinion. This is from an IBM System 360. This is the Model 90, I want to say. I mean, this thing's like six foot wide. Look at all those blinking lights and switches. This thing's beautiful, but it's a mainframe. Everything else up until here has been a microcomputer or a mini computer. This, this is something different. But out of all of these, for front panel DMA, we've got a mandatory set of uh, viewing the contents of memory, modifying the contents of memory, starting and stopping processing, and if we're lucky, we have software addressable I.O. switches that we can turn on and off to play stuff like Kill the Bit. People love playing Kill the Bit. Uh, we can also single step the clock or single instruction, and those are not the same thing, but those are useful, and hopefully protect some memory. Maybe we don't want to run it over our program. And then if you're really extra, if you have the money, you get yourself an ASR33 teletype, and if, you'll notice that you have not only a keyboard and a place to, to see printouts, but you have a paper tape reader. We have storage. We can punch tape now. We're not just limited to whatever he typed in at that time. We have storage, and it's cheap, and that's nice. And if you're really, really living it up, you can afford yourself a glass terminal. This is a uh, ADM3A. Uh, anybody who uses Vim a lot, you'll notice where the positions of the arrow keys are on the home row. That's why. It's all because there is no arrow keys dedicated on there. They program it on something like this that's compatible. You can run Vim on this, no problem. Um, 
stuff like the uh, the VT100 standard, same kind of thing, uh, hazel teens. But then uh, 77 happens. 77 is a watershed year. We finally start seeing appliance computers. The Apple II here, it's got a screen, it's got a keyboard, it's in a nice case. It also does color, by the way, which is nice. Commodore comes out with the PET 2001. Uh, this is the Dash 8 model. It's got a screen built in. It's got Petsky graphics. It's got a tape drive, so you can do storage. That's awesome. Tandy Radio Shack. It's TRS-80 Model 1. It's actually all contained in that keyboard. Everything else is just extra, but you've got graphics. It's the cheapest option, and they dominated the market for a couple of years, about three or so years before they started getting edged out. Um, but that right there, that was your cheap computer. But these are appliance machines. You don't have to homebrew anymore. You don't have to, to build a kit. Because a lot of those machines during the, the micro, uh, early microcomputer era, you're building it yourself. You're getting it out of a catalog. They have keyboards. They have displays. They got basic and ROM. So you can just turn it on. There are, they're turnkey machines. It's beautiful. Commercial software is finally available. Storage is cheap. You can use a cassette drive. You can just use regular audio tape and store your programs and read them back later. If you really need the space, you get a floppy drive. That's nice, uh, but memory's cheap, and all of these are under two grand to get you started. That's pretty nice. So the front panel's dead. R.I.P. Seventy-seven. That's the that's the death knell for it. So I, I was looking around. I, I thought, you know, front panels. Why, why are there none with a six five zero two? Somebody had to have done this, right? I couldn't find any good answers, and I asked about it, and this was the response I got. That's because the 6502 was late enough that folks used the serial link to a terminal. The Apple One had that built in, quite a step forward from a front panel with switches and lights. Or folks used the 6502 with the 6530 with a TIM monitor and ROM to a serial terminal. I call bullshit. Um, these are expensive options. If you're using graphical output up until 77, that means you're investing a lot of money. If you're using a terminal, either glass or, or a teletype, again, you're, you're making a significant investment. Not everybody could do that. A front panel is cheap. A 6502 is cheap. There's got to be a reason some of these, these two technologies weren't combined. So what were people doing? This is a Centertech Sim 1. It's got a hex display. It's got a keypad. It's got a lot of I.O. It's actually a pretty fully featured machine, and you can run basic on it. That's nice, um, but it's a good start. And then I found this, 2015. This is an OSI 300. Ohio Scientific made these to teach you the op codes of 6502, really, really cheap, $99. But it's just switches, LEDs, a handful of buffers, the CPU, and 128 bytes of RAM, and that's it. You are doing your DMA directly into the RAM, and then you're running it from there. But there's no I.O., there's no storage. You have one latchable TTL um, output, and that's it. You don't get anything else. That's it? No, no, I don't believe that. This is what most people think of when they think of a minimal 6502 machine. This is a Kim one. This is MOS Technologies design. Later on, Commodore sold them to after they were acquired. Hexadecimal display, hex keypad, bunch of um, I.O. over uh, 6530s. And you could run basic on this. You could hook up to a teletype or whatnot, but you'd have to really expand it to do any kind of serious work on there. Now, this is only one I've discovered in the last three or so months after this is built. But this is a CGRS Microtech add-on for the Sim 1. It's a software-controlled front panel. The idea is you're running it in software. You can do your DMA. But the machine is running. The, C the CPU is active, and it's helping you through it. It's running a program to do your data entry. That's interesting. Uh, the other ones are doing it kind of in hardware. They're running the, the CPU kind of sitting there quietly, but this one, this is different. And then I just found out about this one very recently. This is the Computar from a late uh, 1977 issue of Byte Magazine, spelled with a K and two U's. Uh, this is just somebody's homebrew that they put into an issue of Byte Magazine, said, here, here's how you build it. I looked through the schematics. It's incredibly convoluted. I can't find any evidence of any of these still in existence. If you find one, please tell me. I want to see it. I just recently got the issue, and I kind of want to flip through it more in detail and see if it's, you know, if you can replicate it. But it looks decently fully featured, but it's a one-off. Let's put it that way. 
this is that uh, that OSI 300 schematic. You'll notice though, it's, it's shutting off the CPU and it's just the buffers are opening up such that you can write directly into RAM. You're not using the CPU. You have to tell it to go be quiet and sit in the corner. Um, and about the same time after I saw the OSI 300, I also came across uh, Grant Cyril's minimal 6502 design. Seven chips. You can build a 6502 machine that'll run basic. Serial, RAM, ROM, CPU, and a couple of, you know, something for glue just to make sure that you get your addressing right. But for the first time, it made sense. And I saw this and I thought, no, this is, this is a great starting point. I need to use this. Why didn't somebody combine that with the OSI 300? So I started, I built with his design. I thought, that's nice. I like this. He's, he's got something going here. I talked with him. You can run basic on it. That's really nice. Um, this is OSI 6502 basic. This is the uh, revision 3.2. It's, it's Microsoft's basic with a couple of tricks added into it, but it's, it's a really fast basic compared to its contemporaries. Um, I thought, no, no, I'm going to make my own machine. I'm going to combine these two things together and create something that's actually going to be filling this, this niche. Because those, uh, those last two, the CGRS Microtech and the, the Computar, only found out about those really, really recently. So I start building just a couple of cards, thinking I want this modular. I found a backplane at a local electronic shop, and I thought, 35 pins, I can fit a bus on that, right? Uh, turns out, yes. But at the time, I wasn't really sure. And it's actually grown beyond that. And there's a couple of jumper wires, but it was a good start. Uh, how many of you have done wire wrapping? Raise your hands. You have? OK. I've technically never done it either. I'm using wire wrap wire, but I'm soldering. Cards are too tightly packed in there. I, I can't fit the, the, the proper kinds of uh, sockets with the square pins. To, to, and I don't have the tools for it, but the, the wire I can find, and it's nice and tiny, you can really pack them in there. So, uh, I got this great idea. I'm going to go out to Tech Shop when they were still in existence. I'm going to use their laser cutter, and I'm just going to cut out a front panel the way I think it should look, based on what I've seen from, like, front panels I like. Yeah, this seems like this will do, and I'll adjust if I need to. There's no electronics back there yet. It's just the switches, and, well, we'll see where we go. Um, so in my, in my travels, I was like, I want to single step the 6502. I think that would be super cool. And everybody tells me, you can't single step the 6502. In fact, you can't do a lot of this DMA stuff you're talking about. You're nuts. You have to, to do some tricks here. And I was like, okay, fine. And somebody points out, hey, Western Design Center still makes a CMOS version. It's got a static core. That's nice. It'll go up to 14 megahertz. Ooh, I don't want to go that fast, but I like that. But the pinout's nearly identical. They're new in production. But the design, it's basically been out since 1978. That's all, that's all right. I thought it was like 80s. No, it's like 78. It's got a bus enable pin. I don't have to add buffers. I don't have to add in a ton of buffers to shut off the address, the data bus, and a bunch of other stuff to tell it to be quiet. I just, I just flip that. That's nice. So I start wiring. I'm working on the front panel. I had ribbon cables. Uh, by the way, this rainbow ribbon cable shit smells absolutely awful. It's like the 1970s was tied up and thrown in the back of a conversion van and died of heat stroke in the sun. It is awful. It's this phenolithic crap. Don't mess with it. Um, a lot of folks, when they try to make their own modern machines using classic processors, 8-bit or otherwise, they use stuff like an Atmel or a PIC or some other modern microcontroller to do all the glue logic and the heavy lifting for them. Um, I think that's cheating. I don't want to do that. I want to do it the traditional methods, all 7400 series logic. Oh, yeah. RAM. I'm making a little bit of a cheat here. Um, so if I wanted to do error-appropriate RAM, I'd have to do one of two things. I'd go with a ton of DRAM, which would basically take up half of the machine, and you have to do timing. No thank you. Or I go with SRAM of the era. Again, kind of not so dense. If I went with original Motorola 6810s, those are 128 bytes. Uh, I would need 256 of them to get up to a full 32K. No thank you. The other option is these are 2K ones. This is from a VIC-20s expansion board to give you up to like 24K or something like that. Again, it's a lot of chips, a lot of wiring for not really any gain. And I say that, you know, even within the context of this. I can do it in one chip. Um, 
But then we also have what's actually controlling the front panel itself here. And th now we're getting into what's actually going on here. So this is the address control card. Its job is to keep track of what address you're at for doing DMA. The top row is just cascaded uh, counters. They're four bits a piece. Together we get a full 16-bit address bus. And then a buffer. Uh, when it comes to entering in data, I thought to myself, you know, I like the idea of push buttons. Toggle switches are nice, but the idea that I can press a switch and I can set and clear a bit, I like that a lot. I thought, that's got to be, I, I got to be onto something there, right? So I start working on my circuitry, and then I go out to Vintage Computer Festival Midwest, and somebody has that HP 1000. And I had never really, I seen them at a distance. I thought they were locking switches. He comes, you know, uh, this guy's demonstrating it, Mike Lowe, and he goes, listen, sit down, let's enter in a program. Okay, sure. I sit down, I start pressing the buttons, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is, this is the idea I had. Somebody did it? That's awesome, that means I can do it. I wasn't sure until this point that it was feasible. I like this. So that's what it takes to make it happen. The top row is just a bunch of flip-flops to store each bit, two bits per chip, and the rest is just interlocking buffers to make sure that data flows in and out when it should, and then when you turn the machine to run and the CPU is in charge, that the data lights illuminate correctly without interfering with whatever's going on in there before. And this is what it ends up looking like when it's running. You know, you have that top row of locking switches to set your address. You can see what address you're actually at. You got the flip switches for, for your data bus. The switches in particular, though, I really like the MSI 8080's design. I think this is fun. Most folks that mess with an Altair will prefer this because of how big the switches are and the extra things that they added in down the line. But those paddle switches are so nice. The problem is... They're a pain to get. CNK switches, these are, uh, what, 7205, something like that. They're momentaries. They're really expensive. And also, um, you can't get them anymore with this type of paddle. They discontinued the J4 and the J5 paddle years ago. So if you want to find them, you get them online somewhere surplus. I found mine at Electronic Gold Mine. Um, I bought out their entire stockpile. All 19 switches. Uh, Turns out that NKK makes a new version. It's a little crunchier, but it gets the job done. I like that. But I also wanted a turnkey. I wanted to be able to get up and walk away. I wanted to take my keys with me so nobody messes with my machine because the best mini computers had that because it was expensive technology. You didn't leave your mini computer unattended. Well, I want that on my cactus. Let's see if I can get it to... There we go. We're back in business. So it starts to come together. It's a mess. It's all packed in there. I want some I.O. 6522VIA. By the way, you can still get new ones of these. They're CMOS now. It's nice. Right now I'm only doing uh, LEDs for output. I'm still learning input. This is a learning process. I've been at this for over a year, and I'm still learning all kinds of new stuff about building a machine. But that's fun. Serial. This is the old serial card. This is actually the Gen 2 serial card. We're based on the 6850. It's Motorola's part. That whole right side, that's just for doing baud rate control. Screw that. I don't want to do that. I don't have to change a jumper every time. I want software control. Enter the 6551. Thank you, Commodore. It's dense. It's software control baud rate. I can fit two of them on a card. Isn't that nice? Okay, one other cheat that you can see on here. Um, the Max 232s for level shifting for RS-232 because I really, really don't want to mess with... Uh, what is it, Motorola's 1488s and 89s? I don't like those chips. I don't want to mess with those. I don't want to have to do extra stuff with transistors. This is cheap and easy, and really there's no benefit of doing it the older way. But then again, I, you know, who am I kidding here? All right, let's see if the next one will load. Let's go to single stepping. This, this is a large image. I'm only at 800 by 600, so give it a second. I found an old MOS document about single stepping. This is what they suggest as their circuitry for it. It is insane, but you can do single step and cycle. I can't find any evidence of anybody actually doing this. And then I found some guy on the uh, by the name of Thrashbar. He came up with this, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. I want to see how that worked out. I talked to him. He goes, yeah, I never used it. Uh, that was 15 years ago. Look, man, just you don't want to use that circuit. Okay. Looking through the Apple One manual, 
begrudgingly. Um, I'm, I'm not an Apple fan. I'm a Commodore fan. I don't want to look through their documentation. This is Waz's idea for a single step circuit. Look at that. It's simple, but I can't find any evidence of anybody using it. After a while, Thrashbark says, look, try this. This will get you where you're going. Okay, I build it. Doesn't work. I'm probably doing something wrong, but I thought, you know what, let me just try it the way I think it should be done. This is probably too simple, right? I mean, it's really just a, a multiplexer to, to choose between step and one megahertz clock with a run halt and bus enable and stuff like that. It sort of works. Kind of. Sort of. Something I, I didn't expect to actually run, but sometimes it actually will do it. Once you get into serial routines, it doesn't want to it doesn't want to chooch. And the result is an entire pile of cards. Now, some of these are duplicates. Um, this one up here is for running a real NMOS CPU, and it's mostly buffers just to shut off the buses. Um, just last weekend, I was out at Vintage Computer Festival Midwest, or sorry, uh, West, uh, Mountain View, California, and the guy with the Monster 6502 was out there. Raise your hand if you know about the Monster 6502. Okay, we talked to this guy. He's got a, you know, it's a 6502, but it's big. It's made up of individual transistors, and I go... That would be a lot of fun to connect up to my machine. And I talked with him and said, yeah, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? Just jokingly. And he goes, yeah, that would be awesome. He's serious. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm building an NMOS card now. Um, but I got to run at 50 kilohertz. That's a little slow. So I built a separate board for it. You can actually see it right there, that little green guy with the three chips on it. That's just for the monster. First day didn't go so good. I had bus contention on one pin. After we got that settled, the next day, we ran. It'll work with a, you know, a real NMOS processor, but it'll also work with the monster. And this is the result. It runs. It actually somehow runs. Um, surprises the hell out of me every time. So let's get into the actual switches that are controlling stuff. Pardon me. First things first, we got a reset switch all on the far side here. We want to be able to reset most of the smarter chips. Next to that, we have a run halt switch. We want to be able to stop and start the CPU at will. When the CPU is running, the rest of the front panel locks down. You can't do anything. That's a good thing. We don't want to mess with the CPU as it's trying to execute stuff. But the second you halt, the CPU says, okay, I'm taking a back seat. It goes and has a smoke, and everything else is in control now. Next to that, we got our single step switch, so we can give a single pulse. At that same time, it's briefly locking down the front panel and briefly unlocking the CPU just for that one cycle. Next to that, we have the broken protect switch. It never seems to want to work for me. Um, the idea is to protect RAM, turn it into ROM temporarily. That's nice. Then the next two, these are my favorite switches because these are the ones that do real work. The paint's coming off of the, uh, the green examine switch because of how much I press it. So if we press it upwards, we can do an examine. Oops, I halted. Uh, wrong green switch. What we've done now is two different things in one quick sequence. We've checked this uh, whatever the address switches are at, and we've loaded that into the counters. We've preloaded them. Then afterwards, the data control card says, okay, it's my turn, and it loads up whatever's at that address and displays it on the LEDs. Right now, it's zero. But what if we want to go to the next address? If I've got an OSI 300, I've got to manually set and increment these switches one by one. That is a pain in the ass. Let's, let's do an examine next. Let's just move through it seamlessly. Why not? And then if we want to go back, we do another examine. We hop back to where we started. Deposit. What if I want to make a change? I bring the deposit switch up. It opens up the right latches, and the data flows back from the data control card out to the bus and writes to the RAM uh, or whatever other device is out there. Obviously, we can't write to ROM, but we can write to some of the other peripheral chips, uh, which is nice. But what if I want to do a lot of data entry really fast? We got to deposit next switch. And this is a point of contention between me and um, inside guys because this is doing three different things here. It's sequenced together. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's doing three different things here in quick succession. The first is it's copying, uh, it, it's writing to RAM or whatever it may be. And then it's immediately being followed up with an increment address. And then after that, a load data bus. 
three things all in quick succession. It's run by a 555 timer. Um, I also got the, the, the broken out version of the 555. I was thinking about putting it in there just to have one more thing from uh, evil mad scientists hooked into my machine. That's going to be fun. Um, but it's just a ser series of, of flip-flops that are in quick succession. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. To make sure that we, we do each thing instead of having to have individual switches for, okay, first I increment and then I load. No, no, no. We want it doing it for us. Um, and then, that's actually what it looks like here. 555 timer up top. We got some stuff to lock out parts of the front panel. Debouncing. Um, yeah, we got it all. Most of the rest of it is just blue logic to make sure the timing happens correctly. Let's back to that address control card. I don't know why this is in here twice. Data control card again. So input buffers, output buffers, it's, it's a nightmare. I, I figured out how to do it with like two buffers now because I've discovered the wonders of the 74-245. I love that chip. So here are a couple of takeaways. Front panels are really, really, really tedious, but you get a ton of control. You are talking right to the bits. Wiring a computer from the ground up is very time consuming, but you know what? I, it's fun. And the blinking lights make it all worth it. I, I think so anyway. I want to give a shout out to all these guys. These are folks that help me out in some way, shape, or form, either with encouragement or pointing out a technical fault or suggestion or helping me debug something along the way. These guys are awesome. Uh, plenty are from the vintage computer community. Uh, and I want to thank all of you, of course, for coming out and listening to me ramble about my computer built 40 years too late. Um, any questions that we, you, before we actually let you guys, you know, run loose, run some basic or stuff like that? Or do you want me to run basic on here? And I mean, I've got a couple of programs to demo if you guys are ready to play. I don't know how much time we got. All right. First questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I wrote this last night, and I wrote and I stored it up in NVRAM because I've got 2K of battery-backed NVRAM because I don't have core yet. I say yet because next month a guy is hooking me up with 4K core boards, and I'm like, yes, please. I, if I'm doing everything tedious, might as well try. So um, first things first. Uh, let's see, where did I put this? Yep, there it is. Okay. I just want to make sure that we jump to the right. Okay, so we're going to jump to where this program actually exists. And this will only take a little bit. Oh, 20 minutes? Awesome. Thank you. Okay, we got that. And it's at 00. zero. Sometimes deposit doesn't always play nice. BA. Awesome. Larson scanner. All right, so we're running something. More importantly, hopefully it'll let us. Will it? Nope, the 6522 does not play nice with single stepping. Oh well, we'll live. We'll just run it at full speed, why not? Uh, that took me, I don't know, 50 or so bytes last night. I, I thought it was fun. You guys want to run basic? Let's run some basic. All right. I actually have to switch ROM chips here. just want to make sure it's actually there. And we'll hop into hyperterminal so we can show you guys what's actually going on. This is from the last time when I tested it, so all right. Good. All right. Cold start 32768 because we have a third full 32k of RAM. We could do a lot with this. Terminal width, 80 columns, because why not? There we are. We're in basic. Want me to load up a program? 
All right, I don't want to type the whole thing. So I actually prepared a few that I figured you guys might like. Let's see, who doesn't love a good Mandelbrot set? This is going to take a minute, so it's going to load itself up. Yeah, I'm still learning clear to send and uh, re request to send uh, specifics to make sure that the timing works out perfectly. So what I do is I just slow it down and it runs. Seriously, any questions? Anybody want to come and play with it? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Okay, I'm running everything off of 5 volts. Right now we're actually running off of a USB battery uh, pack and we'll be good for a while. We're actually also running my converter for, for the laptop to turn it into HDMI. Um, it's less than an amp. We're not drawing all that much. The core memory is going to make that spike. What was the second one? Okay, I'm still working on those calculations because I get this question a lot. When's the kit coming out? I'm working on it, I swear. All of these boards are hand-wired. I don't want to force you guys to do that. I want one board just for the front panel that you socket in those switches. But uh, VCF East, VCF West, people are asking me, like, hey, when's this coming out? Uh, just pay attention to my website. Um, I've got business cards afterwards with little information about it if you're curious. But hey, look, the program's ready. First things first, let's just make sure it all ended. Oh. I'm not high, uh, caps lock. It gets mad about lowercase. Okay, it's there. And there we go, it's running a Mandelbrot set. It's gonna take a little while. I'm, it's about eight minutes or so. When, uh, when we had this hooked into the monster, since it's 20 times slower, you do the math. It took a while uh, just to get like three lines done, especially when it got into the really nitty gritty computing. Um, yeah, we gave up on that really quickly. Any other questions, curiosities? You want to come touch the front panel? Be my guest. Since it's locked down right now, go nuts. Oh, we got two questions. All right. You in the back first? You're going to have to speak up. Okay. Some of that needs debouncing, yes. Um, the top row stuff... Because we're first going, uh, we're locking down and we're going into something that's only going to be read once in a great while, the load side of the address control uh, counters, we don't need any debouncing there. For these here, yes, we are debouncing just a little bit. Um, it's not too crazy with the flip flops. It, it seems to be okay without extra, too much extra circuitry there. These guys over here, for the momentaries of examine, deposit, yes, we are debouncing for sure. Um, it's like a little RC circuit with a uh, an inverter. It seems to work out all right. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Um, most of what's going on for at least the status control card, a lot of the, only one of those is doing the debouncing. Everything else is lockout and sequencing to make sure that it's uh, pulling stuff high and low accordingly as it's going through the, the sequencing operation. So only one of those is doing debounce. You had a question. We're stepping by clock cycle, not by instruction. With uh, simpler programs, you can actually watch it go through and you can see it doing a right back to the data bus. It's really fun. We might do one of those in a bit here if y'all are curious. Now, we don't have to go through the whole thing, but the point is we're running, we're doing heavy computing, and you can see the lights when it gets to something really tough. The address lights will kind of choke up for a bit. All right, let's go to something fun. People like fun games and stuff like that, right? We actually have Control-C, which is nice. Okay. Any of you all played Lunar Lander before? I found the book from 1977 and I thought, I got to play this. So far, nobody actually wants to play the game. Every time I demonstrate it, somebody goes, oh no, I'm going to crash. I'm like, yeah, we know you're going to crash. That's the point of the game. You got to try anyway. 
And yes, I went through all the text because I'm, I want to pay homage to the folks that came before me because I don't know if you can tell, um, I'm 28 today. This is my birthday. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little young to remember this stuff. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to be here a while. Any other questions? Curiosities? All right. Did I have an electronics experience before this? Um, I dabbled. I'm more dangerous than anything else. Um, this is how I've learned a lot of the stuff in uh, hardware and software. Assembly, I'm, I never had any need for assembly until I did this. And uh, one of the few things that's actually doing anything of importance in here that I had to rewrite was uh, the serial routines. I had to change them over to use a different chipset. Um, but in terms of 7400 series logic, I, yeah, I played with small circuits once in a great while and not really. I just kind of learned by the seat of my pants. I'm surprised nothing has lit on fire in the process. I haven't blown any capacitors. I haven't made anything go poof um, yet. Give me time. I, it surprises the hell out of me. I'm, I'm going to make circuit boards because um, that's a skill I don't have. I can, I can solder. I love to solder. I think it's therapeutic. So that's why everything's you know done the way it is. But also making your own PCBs, that's, that's a skill I need to, to pick up first before I can actually do anything. Man, that is a long freaking program. Um, so yeah, I don't want to type it in by hand. We'd be here for hours. I don't want to force that on y'all. I, I mean, I've sp I spent hours just writing, you know, 50 bytes with the, with the toggle switches and debugging and figuring out how to get the loops right. Because um, I'm still learning branching. The specifics of 6502 branching and how it does a backwards step is a little funky. I don't know if y'all have messed with that. It's, it's, it's something to learn. We're almost there, I swear. Either way, it's not going to end well for whoever's in the craft. How did... What got me into old computers? Okay. Um, eighth grade. I'm in computer science class. It's the last day they said, all right, listen, let's just, let's just distract the kids with a, a documentary. And I'm sitting up front on watching this thing. And, uh, and everybody else is like, this is the lamest thing ever. And I'm like, oh, there was a time before where computers looked like that? I want to know more. And the next thing I know, I'm on eBay and I bought a C64. It's been downhill ever since. Um, the pile of VIC-20s is insurmountable. But basic is fun. What I need, and this is something I'm learning how to do because I, I want to try to either make my own or adapt something just for this architecture. Um, I don't have a, a, a monitor in ROM. I don't have any way to go through the assembly by hand. If I want to do a, a memory dump, I have to write it in basic or use the front panel, which is fine. I don't mind that. But everybody who makes their own machines, they seem to do a, a monitor ROM. And I'm like, okay, I need to learn how to do that. I'm in full ignorance on, on how that, that works. I'm, I'm, I'm going to figure it out. Hey, look, it's there. All right. You guys want to crash into the moon? Let's go with a couple of burn rates of zero just to make sure we're not wasting fuel. All right. We're going to slam headfirst in the moon, just so y'all know. All right, y'all call the numbers from now on because now it's getting into the good stuff. Seriously. 46, you got it. 1,000. Uh, all right, yeah, no, let's try 1,000 because I want to see how well it breaks. Um, okay. I don't think that's normal. All right, what was the next one? Anyone? All right, well, then I'm doing 100. Yeah, okay, we're slowing down. We're in the three-digit range. Most people end up going upwards and backwards, and it's just not good. Oh, see, we're going in reverse. We're leaving the moon, which means that we're definitely screwed now. Yep. Yep. It screwed up, and then it told us it was a perfect landing. Clearly, I typed this in wrong. 
Okay. Let's see if I can get it. Okay. Let's load up something a little more fun. Let's actually see the contents of memory. Oh, I know, the light show. Everybody loves the light show. So I wanted to mess with the 6522 because I'm still learning how that operates. I want to do input because I really want to play kill the bit. Y'all remember kill the bit? Because these all lock out on runtime when the CPU is in charge, we can't press any of these buttons. I mean, we can, but it's not going to do anything. Kind of need software addressable buttons. And so I'm still learning how that's going to operate, but we're off to a good start. So this will go through a bunch of different light shows and whatnot. Um, I got a full memory map if somebody wants to actually sit down and hack for a while and run something fun on there. I'm willing to hook up fun toys to this if people are curious. And we can take it apart if you really want to. I don't mind. Don't worry, it's not super long of a program. Any other questions? Any other curiosities? Yes. Yes, I have thought about doing a user port Commodore 64 style because I got a ton of peripherals for that. And I've got a 6522. Why not? Uh, now, actually, while we're waiting, there, there are a couple of things I have thought about adding to this cassette storage. There's no permanent storage on here yet. Um, the card bus is kind of full, but after I condense a little bit, yeah, I want cassette storage. I want uh, to see about learning about video. Uh, does the name Don Lancaster ring any bells for anybody? I've got a cut. All right, I've got a copy of the TTL cookbook. That's how I started designing for this. All right, is the light show going? Yay, the light show is going. Wish it was bigger. Somebody find me some giant LEDs. Um, the uh, the other book that he did. I mean, there's the there's the TV typewriter cookbook, and then there's also the cheap video cookbook. I just scored a copy of that. I kind of want to see what it's like to build my own video hardware from scratch. The other alternatives are a VIC-1 chip, because I really like the early colors and the blockiness. I know it's only 22 columns. I like it anyway. Uh, the other option is um, Motorola's 6845 chip, the CRTC, because I'm semi-familiar with that one, but it'd be useful for, for running programs and be able to see what's going on. And... All right, that's enough of that. I got another one. It's short. I'm getting funny looks. Oh, I'm coming up on time. All right. I'll run one more and then we'll pack it up and, and move aside here so the next guy can come on in. So one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to see what the contents of memory were. So I just wrote a simple memory dump and then ha have it also simultaneously write out to uh, the, the LEDs so we can see what's going on. Let's see, other stuff that I want to add to this when the time comes. Um, some folks have been like, do you want to do floppy disk storage? And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. That's kind of boring to me. What I really want is paper tape. If you know anybody selling a paper tape reader and punch, please point them in my direction. I'm trying to find one. I've been looking. They're tough, they're tough to find. I know they're out there, but I don't want to buy a full ASR33 because I don't have anywhere to put that and they're loud, and they are clunky, and when they break, they really break. It's almost done, I swear. I need to make this faster, don't I? Oh yeah, the uh, the address control, um, the software controllable LEDs are coming directly out of the 6522. There's also a second bank that's not plugged into anything. All right, last thing we'll do. Uh, let's see, four seven zero zero zero, four seven. So we're seeing what's in some dead part of memory. I don't think there's really too much going on in here, but we'll come across something, I'm sure. There it is. Hey, look, we're finding garbage finally. All right. Actually, this is that, that uh, Larson scanner program from before. 
is it sad that I'm starting to remember the opcodes? And now we're back into garbage. All right then. Well, I'm going to leave it at that just so the next guy can get set up. But uh, thank you very much for coming out and seeing the cactus.